Hello, hello, everybody. Gracias. Uh, <laughs> I don't speak enough Spanish to be able to give this talk in Spanish, but I'm happy to hopefully read a little bit if you have questions in it. But uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, my name is Cassidy, and, and uh, I work at Netlify, and I am here to talk about Next.js with all of you. And so I will be doing some presentations with, with slides, and then I'm going to get into some coding, and, and I'll show you how a Next.js application is structured and we can go from there. And then at the end, uh, there will be time for questions. And so you can ask as many questions as you'd like, and I will answer as many of them as I can. Um, so let's get started. We've already said my name. I'm Cassidy. You can find me at Cassidy most places on the internet. And so uh, feel free to reach out on Twitter, Twitch, GitHub, anything uh, at Cassidy. Um, So first, I wanted to talk to you about why Next.js. Uh, why, why would someone use Next.js instead of uh, just React? And uh, Next.js first came about because um, React is a client-side rendering library. You uh, Everything changes on the client side in the user's browser. With Next.js, it brought server-side rendering to React. And so when you have a Next.js application, First and foremost, it was for server side rendering where you can render components on the server side and then have better SEO that way. That being said, um, last year, it's actually just been over a year now um, with Next 9.3 in March last year. Um, they did a shift to static sites as well. And so um, even though it, it did support some static sites uh, in the past, now if you were to use Next.js, um, you could build both a server-side rendering application and a static site generated application and really use the best of both worlds. And it's a very, very powerful framework. There's a lot of cool things that you can do with it. And I'm going to talk through how some of it works next. And so first of all, um, what features should you know about um, when, when you're actually putting a Next.js application together? Um, there's a lot of developer experience nice to haves. And um, some of those include hot code reloading. And so when you're working on your application, it'll reload quickly on the side. You don't have to refresh the page. That's actually powered by React Fast Refresh. And um, in the past few days, actually, uh, Next.js 10.1 came out. And with Next.js 10.1, um, it made fast refresh much faster. Uh, I, I think it was something like 20 times faster. And so it's nice and fast. And what React Fast Refresh does is when you have an application that, um, let's just say you have a counter, a very simple counter. And as you increase or, or decrease the count, the background color of your application changes, something simple like that. As you change the colors or update your code, your state stays the same. And so if I were to say, okay, I really wanna check the state at five, originally before React Fast Refresh, you have to say, okay, I'm gonna check my code, then click the counter all the way up to five. Okay, that's good. Change the code again, click the counter all the way up to five. It will maintain the state now. And so that's that's what React Fast Refresh does. It's, it's really, really nice. Um, there, there's some other performance things uh, along the, uh, the underbelly of the application, but you know, fast refresh is, is a big one to understand for that. Um, there's also a lot of styling options available with Next.js. With the styling options that come out of the box, you can use styled JSX, you can use CSS modules, you can use less, you can use SAS, you can use uh, pretty much any styling option that you want. Um, you can throw Tailwind really easily, you can throw in Bulma really easily. It, it all will just work which is really, really nice. Um, and, and so the fact that those are out of the box, if you, if you wanna use it, you can use it. It also has TypeScript support out of the box. You don't have to install anything special to make TypeScript work. You just change your file names to .ts instead of .js and it'll work. Um, same with environment variables. Um, you can make a .env file and add environment variables in and it will use your environment variables. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about how those work a little bit later. And then it also does automatic code splitting. And so if there's any JavaScript that you write, but it's not used on the page, when you bundle up your application, it will get rid of that code that you're not using. So that way you always have a performant bundle that's pushed to the browser. Um, now, the routing in Next.js is really, really interesting, and um, ooh, I accidentally pushed forward. So the routing in Next.js is 
page-based routing. So when you make a file in the pages directory, it automatically becomes a route. You don't need to set up, for example, with React Router, how you need to uh, list all of your different routes in a giant routes.js file. You don't need to do that. It just works when you add um, a file to that routes or to the pages directory. There are some caveats with that, and I'll talk about more of those later too when we're getting into the code. The API for Next.js is pretty simple. Um, these are these are kind of the four main ones that people use the most. There there are some other ones, but but uh, in terms of these ones, there's Next Link. Um, Next Link is a glorified anchor tag. It, it wraps around uh, links so you can link between pages. But what it does is it actually does client side transitions, so they're super fast, and so it does some preloading of pages as you navigate between pages. And so Next Link is pretty nice for that. With Next Head, that is a React component for the HTML head, so you can programmatically change your title or your meta tags or anything like that, and that'll happen in next head. Um, next router is a React hook, and with that, that'll let you get uh, query parameters, that'll let you get the current path, that'll let you do some redirects and navigation, that, that's what the router does. And then next AMP, that allows you to generate Google AMP pages. And so if you will have a very article-driven website, you can use Google AMP, um, and it's built into the Next.js API, and the Google team actually worked with their team on that. Um, the CLI is very similarly simple. Um, there's next build, which builds your site all together. Um, there's next dev, dev, which runs a development server. There's next start, which runs a production server. And there's next export, which exports your entire uh, Next.js application as a static site. Um, typically, you can you, you don't have to do much with, with any of these. It, you'll run next dev to, to work on this on your own, but it'll be the host that you use, whether you use Netlify or, or AWS Amplifier, Vercel, or any of the other options, um, the, they will be the ones running next build, start, and export. But next dev is really the one that you'll be using the most. Um, you can add custom configurations. So let's just say, you want more than just TypeScript support, you wanna be able to add other elements to it. Coffee script, probably not coffee script, but so something else if you want to add the, those kinds of things to your application. There's a next.config.js, and with that, it's just like webpack modules. You can add whatever loaders, whatever things you might want into your next.config.js, and uh, it's it's fairly simple that way. Um, now, preview mode. This is a particularly interesting feature. Um, and, and this feature and then the next one I talk about are particularly interesting because they're static first, but require some node code to work fully, but they're, they're interesting. So with preview mode in Next.js, what this does is it assumes your site will be a fully static website. But let's just say that you want to preview what a blog post might look like, what a copy change might look like, something with a CMS, and you just want to preview, okay, what will this look like in my application? Great, good. And then you, you go back to editing it. Um, typically, if you do a static site, you have to rebuild your whole, whole site to see that preview, and you can run a deploy preview with that. With preview mode, what it does is it enables a um, what's called a cookie-based redirect. And with that cookie-based redirect, it'll actually server-side render that page so you can see what that looks like. And then if you're happy with it, then you can exit preview mode and then bundle your application. And I can talk a little bit more about that, but it, it's, a, it's a funky feature. And another funky feature that's similar is incremental static regeneration. I have a lot of thoughts on, on this one, ISR, um, but I don't have time to get into all of them right now. So I'll give you a high level overview. And I also wrote a blog post on the subject, which you can read about and, and see more details about. But what incremental static regeneration is, is you have your static application, but let's just say that you have, I don't know, a hundred, a thousand pages that you want to render, but you don't want to render at build time. You want them to just kind of happen later. What happens is you can have your user go to that page. You can, you can go to a page that you didn't define statically and that page will start to build in the background. And then when future users go to that page, it will be a part of the static bundle. It has some funky caching stuff under the hood. In, in an ideal world, it works really, really well and is awesome. Sometimes in non-ideal cases, it doesn't always work. And, and again, I wrote a blog post on the pros and cons of this feature, but it's really, really interesting to learn about the caching under the hood. So I will share a link to that blog post uh, in, in a little bit. 
Um, that being said, let's code. I, I wanted to show you a Next.js starter project so you can actually take all the things that I just told you and actually apply it. Um, this next starter project is right here. It's at cast.run slash next starter, and I'll, I'll put it in the Zoom chat as well. Cast.run slash next starter. It's on my GitHub. I just made a little URL shortener for that. And um, that being said, I'm going to stop sharing just for a second so that I can start sharing my code. And now you can see my face. So one second as I move some windows over and then I will share my screen again. Okay, sharing. All right, so we have our Next.js application. By the way, if the font size on the right is too small, let me know and I can zoom in. Um, so on this left side right here, we have the basic Next.js starter project. And this is the one that I just linked to you. Um, it's, it's on my GitHub on the next Netlify starter. It's using create next app. That is a CLI tool that you can use for that, but it takes out some of the extra things that are built into it. And then it adds a, a couple uh, nice to haves that I always use when I start a new Next.js project. And so um, I will go through all of those with you. But if you click this deploy to Netlify button, it will automatically deploy that project to your um, to to your um, Netlify server. And then it'll also um, clone that to your GitHub or to whatever um, Git provider that you use. But anyway, this is this is what it looks like. Um, and for those asking about my VS Code theme, this is called Hack the Box. Um, anyway, okay, so first I will go through some of the code and you can see what this what this app looks like a bit more under the hood. So first of all, in my package.json, we've got the latest updated Next.js and then also React and React DOM. And that is it. It is, it is very, very straightforward, the, nothing extra beyond that. It's just Next, next and React that's included. Um, in this index.js, we have a pages directory right here. And again, if you can if you can see it, I can I can zoom in a little bit if you can't see it, but I'm gonna do this so that way uh, so we can get all the code in there. Um, this is some basic HTML. You've got the main, which is the header right here that says welcome to my app. You've got a paragraph. And then you've got a footer right here that um, is this component right here. I have a components folder. And so in the components folder, we have the header, which is just, it takes in the text, which is welcome to my app. And then in the footer, it's very similar. Um, but with, with this footer, um, we also have this footer.module.css. And so I'm using CSS modules on the footer right there. And so those are the two components that are included. Um, we also have a jsconfig.json. You might have noticed, and if you didn't, I could show you again. You might have noticed that I used at components um, inside of my index.js right here. That's because um, something that's automatically included in Next.js is absolute paths. And so I can define my components folder as at components, and that means wherever I am importing something, I can just use at components for it. And you can think of this as really useful if we were to do like at design system or something and you wanted to just do or or for example at design system slash buttons and that lets you avoid doing something like dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash whenever you're importing something it's it's really really nice to be able to uh do these kinds of absolute imports um i also did the same thing with styles i added some global base styles so i have a styles folder the global base styles basically just do some normalization and, and nothing much beyond that and uh there's a page here called underscore app.js these two are the the main ones that you will always have in a Next.js application your index.js which is your home page and then underscore app.js this is where you add anything global and this is also where I'll say that there are caveats with Next.js's router, because in the pages directory, that's where you can add as many routes as you'd like. You can add a, a page in here by just doing new file and then contact.js, and I could copy the index.js over into contact right here and rename it contact, and I'll say contact me like this. And then if I were to save it and then over here, go to slash contact, then we got contact me, hey. And so it's that simple to add a route. That being said, whenever you want anything global, it has to go through this underscore app.js. And so that's where these global styles are coming from. 
Um, and so if, for example, you want to share state across your application, you could do it in a context right here. And so I could do a React context and then wrap this component like this. And then voila, you have a context that is shared across your entire application. And that's how that works. The caveat is if you wanted to only share state across like two routes, you can't. Uh, if, you, if you wanted to share it across like four routes out of 10, you can't. You have to share it across all of the routes. Um, and that's the caveat with, with, the, with the router. It, it wraps the entire application in there. And so that, that's, just, that's just something to know. Um, so you might look at this and be just like, ah, yes, this is a regular React component. There's nothing fancy in here. And that is where you're wrong. There are a couple minor things that you can do um, that, that can make a big impact. And that's because page-based components are very different from regular React components. And so right here, this is just a header, again, that takes in text. But um, when you look at the index.js, a page component is actually, it's a React component in this part, but everywhere outside of this is um, node code. And so when you do, when you want to, for example, do something related to uh, querying data or something, you would be using node fetch code outside of this actual function right here. And I'm actually going to show you a more complex example and we can implement something together. But uh, I'm going to go to my GitHub really quick and I'll paste a link. Um, and then inside of here, I'm going to find my next pranks repository. So this next pranks repository, I actually, um, I gave a conference talk on this and, and um, it, it talks about it in here. But in this next pranks repository, um, I use some of that node code and uh, this uh, activates some of that incremental static regeneration that I mentioned before, as well as some other fun things. And so in this prank, I could be like, Cassidy totally nailed this presentation. And then I generate this link. And then this link, when I click on it, it says it rickrolls you. And you didn't expect to be rickrolled today, did you? Um, and then it also says, Cassidy totally nailed this presentation. Not, you've been pranked. And it generates a news page. Uh, and it's pretty fun. And what's what's interesting about this application is it does that kind of node code side of everything, but um, it it does a little bit more with dynamic routes and everything. And so I'm gonna talk through it a little bit. So first of all, you see the home page, which is very, very similar um, to the index.js that I showed you before. It has some state, which uh, state, it's, it's React state, nothing particularly uh, different in there. It uses next link. I'm gonna zoom in a little more so you can see. With next link, it's again, it's just wrapping an anchor tag. And so it, it generates a new link to uh, for users to go to. Um, people are privately DMing me. I didn't expect to be Rickrolled in a webinar. Well, you're welcome. Um, and then also, uh, you notice I have a, a folder called news right here. You can see that uh, in the route, it's very, very small. I'm actually going to paste this in the chat so you can look at this yourself. Um, uh, when you have a folder, it's just slash news and that's what shows up in the route. And then it has this Cassidy totally nailed the presentation. You might notice this uh, file name right here is in brackets. When it's in brackets, that means it's a variable and you can pro programmatically change that. And so Cassidy totally nailed this presentation, matched this variable right here. Inside of here, we have two functions that are worth noting, get static paths and get static props. And those are the big node functions to know inside of page components. Get static paths means whenever you query something in here, that'll generate all the paths that are possible to be rendered in a Next.js application. So for example, if you have a CMS and you wanted to um, have blog posts and you wanted all of your blog posts to just be the, the pages that exist in there, you could call a fetch call inside of this function, and then you would populate this paths directory or, or this paths array with, with all of the uh, strings that you want. Because I have an empty array, that means that it's just a variable. I don't have any predefined paths. It's just going to be a free for all. Um, this fallback is true means that if it's not inside of here, we don't return a 404. If this were false, then it would 404 if it was outside of this, this path thing. And I have more examples on this that I'll talk about. Get static props 
is something where it, it actually passes props to the page component. Um, and so what I'm doing in get static props is I'm getting the parameters of the URL. I'm I'm converting it to a title so that way it can be the title of the article and, and added to the head of this application. Um, and then with that, I'm then passing it to the article and, and it's generating the the Rick roll and everything like that. And so this is this is where your node code lives in get static paths and get static props. Um, I'm going to show you another example. Um, and this one is called Next Adventure. Um, someone mentioned Redux. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be showing Redux, but I will be showing um, X state and, and state machines to, in this particularly, uh, particular example. Um, and so this is an application that I made for Halloween called A Lonely Code Filled Night. It's spooky. Um, and this was a particularly interesting application to build because it uses a bunch of different technologies. So first of all, it uses X state for state management. And I make a choose your own adventure story with uh, X state. And I made, I made a, a story, which I will show you in a second. It also uses React uh, or, or Netlify forms, uh, and it's a React form uh, with Netlify, and it pushes to a Hasura database. And so in the choose your own adventure story that I talk about, um, you can create a character here. And I'm actually going to, I'll put the URL, um, I'll put the URL in the Zoom chat so you can check it out. So when you create a character, you can put your name, you can add the pronouns, you can put the character's favorite smell that comes up in the story, and then you can put your email. Then when you click this send button, what it does is it triggers a serverless function that then populates a Hasura database, which then randomly populates a story. And so this story is, uh, it's different every single time with the different characters that are coming from the database. Don't abuse it, please. Um, and it says, once upon a time, there's a developer named Narwhal who was working very late at night, very late at night on Halloween. And then it's, it says, Narwhal decided to take a break to get a snack. He went to the kitchen, couldn't decide what to eat. We can decide to eat an apple or eat some candy. I'm gonna say we eat some candy. He munched on the candy. Um, then he heard trick or treat that echoed outside. We're going to either ignore the kids or answer the door. I'm going to answer the door. He opened the front door, but no one was there. And it was very, very spooky. Uh, but it was probably good because he ate the last of the candy. We'll ask if anyone's out there. He called out in the night, who's there? Suddenly a werewolf comes up and said, have you heard of TypeScript and eats him? The end. Um, and so this is a very, very detailed story as you can imagine. Um, but what's cool about this is uh, is how it's implemented and not to brag about my own code, but it's kind of neat. And so in the pages, first of all, there's the underscore app.js that I talked about. In that underscore app.js, we have the global styles, but we also wrap the entire application in a React context. And this React context is something that I put in a context folder and that shares the state across the entire application. The other pages are, there's the make your own page. And then in this make your own page, that's where we have the form that I talked about. And it's otherwise a very, very simple uh, custom form there. And then we also have a success.js. This is a page that shows up whenever you make a, a new character. And then uh, index.js also just navigates between the different pages. Those ones aren't at in as interesting. I'm going to show you next the context because the context has some very interesting elements to it. So first of all, an app context, this is creating a React context that pulls in um, a character, which is pulling in from that uh, character database that I that I mentioned in Hasura. And uh, we generate a random character that we then pass to the rest of the application. And then that character is the thing that is used in the story. Um, for the rest of context, we have a state machine. And this state machine is generated with X state. And it is kind of, a, it's kind of hard to pull in all of the code into your brain right now because it's big. But uh, what's nice with X state is it actually has a visualization so you can draw out the tree that you want in, in uh, their visualization library and then turn it into code. Um, and so I have all of these uh, first levels of the story where, where you start the story and then there's the first level of the story, the second level and the third level. You can go deeper, but this is, this is how that works. And then I generate a state machine. And so for every single state, 
I have the the starting value and then I have the story. And then every time you click to a different thing, so the the first button there was going to the kitchen. Now there it goes to the story and then there's two different states that it can go to and then it goes out into a tree. It gets fairly complex as you can see it, it the the code is long for generating this whole story, um, but that that's that's how it it generally works. Um, and then at the end, I create the state machine and I pass it to the React context that we talked about. Um, one other thing that I, that was just kind of interesting was I made a pronoun generation library in here. This is not Next.js, I just thought it was kind of fun, um, where when a person picks a masculine or feminine or non-binary pronouns, um, it then passes that to the different story uh, portions so that way it can be correct with the character that is passed in. So anyway, once we've made this state machine, we pass it via context to the rest of the application. Then we can go to uh, back to our pages and we have this S folder right here. This S folder is the story. Now this is a more funky file name again, where it's in the brackets, but also it has dot, dot, dot in it. And so it has dot, dot, dot story. That means that Yes, it's a variable name, but it also can be spread. And so when we navigate through the application, if you were to go through it, snack time, we'll eat an apple this time. The path in there, I'm going to paste it in the Zoom chat so you can see a bit more. Um, you can see how it has slash S, which is the, the folder name, start, which is the start of the story, then snack time, then eat an apple. Because it has that dot, dot, dot in the file name, it spreads it out. And so you can have as many paths matching that as you want. And still, if you want to define those kinds of paths, you, you would use the get static props and, and populate those paths. Um, but in this particular case, it's just so that way we can keep track of where we are in the story. And so inside of here, I, I have the story block, which pulls in the text from the state machine. And then whenever you click the button, what it does is it uses that use router hook that I told you about, that, that uh, next router API right here. Um, it pulls in the router and then it basically makes a little bit of a redirect. And so it does a router dot push. And so for every single pay, uh, page in the story, phase of the story, however you wanna call it, it, it adds it to, to the different pages. And so you can, th this is actually a, very small component. It's it's less than sixty lines of code, um, but this powers the entire story with uh, with that X state um, library. And so it's 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 pretty interesting what you can do with these uh, pages that are a combination of everything. The way that I did this, this is actually client side routing to all of the different pages of the story. But at the same time, it's also statically generated because we statically generated the home page as well as the make your own character page, the success page, and then just the, the kind of shell. This, this uh, dot, dot, dot story page, we statically generate that, that individual page, but then we client side generate all of the other components in there because of how the link works and because of how the router works. It's, it's kind of funky to wrap your mind around. I admit even making this this demo, I was kind of like, oh, so if I do it this way, this will server side render that page. But if I do it another way, it'll client side render it. It, it kind of combines the all three of the worlds of client side rendering, uh, static site generation, and server side rendering all into one framework, which, which is, is very, very powerful. And so, for example, let's just say I wanted to make some kind of catalog of content. I could theoretically pull in a page statically, have a database, and then client side search through uh, the directory and have it all live in one giant code base. Um, and so I, I mentioned this uh, code base before I'm going to paste it in there. Um, I saw that there were, there were some uh, questions about testing. This particular application I didn't test, probably should have, but I would probably use either Jest or React testing library for it. Um, so anyway, if you wanted to uh, query an API, you would use something like that, uh, that get static props and, and get static paths. I want to be aware of time. I think I have a little bit of time to, to query something. And so uh, we can do that really quick. Does anybody have any questions while I uh, get ready to query something? I want to make sure that I get questions answered. OK. I'm going to keep going in. And so let's just say I wanted to query an API right here. Um, I actually have a gist 
I'm going to pull up my gist on GitHub. I have a gist where I query Pokemon somewhere. Um, uh, there's a Pokemon API that is nice and simple to use. I'm going to search Pokemon yours. I guess I don't. That's fine. I'm just going to go to uh, pokeapi.co. And we have the Pokemon API here. So we can we can query that Pokemon API and, and I can show you what that can look like in Next.js. And so let me pull up my starter again. And so let's just say inside of contact, um, instead of contact, I'm going to rename this to Pokemon. And then in Pokemon.js, I'm going to do uh, export async function, get static props. And then in here, this is where I'm going to fetch the Pokemon API. And so it's going to be this HTTPS Poke API. Let's do let response equals a wait fetch. And then in here, and then I'll do Charmander for now. Okay. And so in here, what we want to do is we want to return an object that has props, and then props will have response right here. And that response can be Pokemon, uh, and we'll pass it right here. And I might need to do some parsing, um, but we'll start with this. Now, this is this is the part where I wanted to talk again about the, the node and the React stuff. Inside of this, this is just React. Inside of this, this is node. And so if I were to do, for example, console.log response right here, um, what will then happen is, uh, let me actually restart my dev server and then refresh the page. Oh, I got to actually go to slash Pokemon. OK, ooh, that's yelling at me. This is fine. Uh, um, when I when I do that, it's this is giving me a node error. It's 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 console.logging down here and not console.logging in the browser. Um, and this is my own fault. I probably should have prepped my API call before doing this this part of it, which is fine. Um, one second. I think I have it written down somewhere. Yeah, I'm just going to copy some of this really quick on my monitor and then paste it over here. OK. Now, if I were to do a response, OK, Pokemon is not defined. Oh, that's my own fault again. Ah, oh, sorry about this. I, again, I needed to, to copy and paste this. Oh, I need to call .json. Thank you. You're right. I'm going to a wait and then .json. Thank you for that. <laughs> the joys of live coding. Okay, beautiful. Okay, look at that. We've got we've got the sprites. We've got the name of the Pokemon. We've got Charmander. All of that. Thank you for the .json thing. I needed that. Um, and so now we can actually pass that to our page. OK, so I'm going to inspect element right here. Now, again, in the console, we have nothing. But if I were to do console.log response right here, now it's actually going to be putting it into the browser console. And so this is, this is the context thing I was telling you about. This is Node. This is React. This is where the browser is, is doing things. This is where Node is doing things. What's cool about this, though, right now we're just we're doing this as a developer. We're doing this as run dev. But this happens at build time when you deploy your site. And so if I were to deploy this site somewhere, I don't know why it's doing this double A wait. I'm not going to question it right now. Um, when we deploy our site, all of the fetches that we do inside of here will happen at build time. That means when the person who is going to your site accesses your page, they won't have to wait for the Pokey API to return Charmander. It's going to just 
work. It's just going to have the result of that API call from build time. And so it's super, super performant when you have a site that is statically generated at build time where, where you make all of your API calls then, and then the user will just get what is returned to the browser. It doesn't, it doesn't care when those, uh, those API calls happened, it'll just actually be, be generated in there. A double wait is needed because of promises. Oh yeah, eh, again, it's doing it live. Um, and so we, we have this response. I, I could say like, instead of contact me, I could say something like, hello, and then response.name. And then look at that, hello, Charmander. And then we could pull in a sprite like this. And so if I wanted to do an image tag, I could do image SRC. And then in there, I think it's response dot sprite. Response dot sprites dot front default. Yes, maybe save it, try it. Yeah, look at that. We got Charmander. Um, and so we, we could do this with all of the different Pokemon. We could actually do this where if we did get static paths and turned this into uh, the, the square brackets, we could generate a page for all of the different Pokemon, have that run at build time. And then whenever a user goes to slash Pokemon slash Charmander slash Pokemon slash Pikachu, so any of these things, those pages will already be generated and it'll just, it'll just work for them. They don't have to worry about the Poke API going down or something because the pages have already been generated. Um, if you have dynamic paths parameters, can you pass the values you want generated at build time? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what get static paths does. And I'm trying to be aware of the time because I want to get questions answered. Um, I'm going to try this really quick. And so in here, I'm going to make a new folder. I'm going to call it Pokemon. And then inside of here, I'm going to have a new file and I'm going to do in brackets pokey.js like this. I'm going to copy all of the code that we wrote in here and put it inside of here. And I'm going to rename this to nothing. Um, just to have that there. Um, okay, so now we have a 404 because of that, that makes sense. Um, but now we want to be able to go to Pokemon and then this pokey.js. So what I wanna do is I wanna do export async function and then get static paths. And then inside of here is where go I'm going to get all of the different Pokemon names. And because I don't wanna go through too many API calls, I'm just going to say, um, we're going to return this object in here and then paths, we're just going to have three Pokemon or say whatever Pokemon you like. And I'm just going to put Charmander and then Ditto and then whoever says the first Pokemon, I will put it in there. Someone said Mudkip, nice. Okay, cool. Wow, there's actually so many. Sure, I'll do, I'll do a few other ones. Easy. Okay, anyway, I'll, I'll stick with these for now. So we get these we get these paths that are passed to the array. And I'm also going to do fallback is false because I want all other pages to 404 outside of these pages. Now with these paths, I also need to do slash Pokemon. And so it's actually going to be slash Pokemon slash Charmander. This is something that I think is a little quirky, but eh, it's okay. And so it's, it's slash Pokemon slash all of these different things. And now, Inside of get static paths or get static props, I get the params. And then the params will be that Pokemon name. And then that Pokemon name will be passed inside of here. And so it'll be params.pokey, I think. We'll see if that's correct. Um, but, uh, and so if I were to refresh the page now, oh, it's, it's slash Pokemon slash Charmander. Yay, okay, it worked. And now if I did Pokemon slash Mudkip, yes, it worked, yay. And so we're, we're pulling in Pokey because that's the, that's the file name there. We're getting the different parameters to pass to each of these and then we're fetching all of that. And so at builds time, we're going to get these four paths generated as well as the response called at build time. And so our users don't have to wait for the API to be called. They can just go to that page. Woo! Is this feasible with large data sets? Yes. We actually, I don't know 
how much I'm allowed to say, because I don't know who, which customers are secret of ours, but some of our customers at Netlify in particular who do this exact thing, they generate, there, there was one customer that we had recently that generated 400,000 pages. And because they did static first, static builds really, really fast. If you don't have a lot of serverless functions or anything, you just want to generate the pages and, and call, the, call them in these functions. Um, we had one customer that had thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pages, and uh, their build time was, I think, four minutes for all of them. And so that, that's really, that's really, really not bad when you do purely static. And then if you, if you start adding more things like serverless functions and more detailed things, you will get longer build times, but it's totally feasible to be able to do that. Um, if you did want the user to load any Pokemon, not just the four we define in paths, um, then actually, I think I could do fallback is true. And I'm going to try this. I'm going to say Mewtwo and see what happens. Yeah, it didn't like that. That's fine. <laughs> um, so we we do need to actually generate so, uh, more of these because it, it'll be upset. Um, so what I would do here if we wanted any Pokemon and not just any of uh, not just what's here, um, because right now if I were to do uh, fallback is false it'll do a 404 if i did mute too otherwise it, it errors out what we could do is we we have to do a bit more validation um but you could query the pokemon api right here and then just get all pokemon names i have a demo of this somewhere but i don't know where it is off the top of my head um but you you would query all the pokemon names that you want you would still pass it to the paths array and then you would get the params the exact same way and get static props okay I am now going to stop sharing my screen and start answering questions so that way we can get all questions answered and I, I can go back to showing code if needed, but I see that there are a lot of questions here, so I just wanted to check on that really quick. Okay, so um, what happens if the requests change after the after the build? There's a few things that you can do, um, and there's actually a really good case study on this on the Netlify blog that was just released like last week, um, because that that one of one of uh, the customers that we had dealt with that. Um, and it was a very, very interesting case study. Uh, I'm pasting it in the chat. Um, so what a lot of people do is they have some kind of webhook. And so whenever the webhook is, is queried, it'll just rebuild the site with the new data. Um, but also one thing that we do with Next.js is let's just say you want to do incremental stack regeneration or you want to do server-side rendered pages. You can still server side render those pages with serverless functions um, and that's that's how we do it where if you were to um, do some more server side rendered pages which um, let's just say i did want to not just query pokemon but query something else or or, or have some pages that aren't included in the original build um, i mentioned before that i have a blog post at cast.run slash isr to talk a bit more in detail on that um, you can do that and it'll just use a serverless function to query it and and so you can server side render those pages if you don't want to wait for the build every single time that is a possibility um that being said it's slower for your users and so it's kind of like you have you have to decide who who is more important your your developer time or your user time there's no wrong answer there but that's that's something to, to consider for that um Let's see, how is the cache and validation process or what are the strategies around how specific assets or pages work? Look at my ISR blog post because because that that answers some of the, the caching things. We actually have some new things coming out next week around this particular subject. And so keep an eye out because I can't talk about it until then. <laughs> um, but uh, the 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 cache and validation typically when you do a new rebuild um it's an atomic and immutable deploys and so you'll get a brand new cache and a brand new deploy with, with every single one um let's see if you don't have pokemon on the paths we could use get server side props yes yes you can so you can use get server side props once again that's something that works in Next.js, but it kind of moves away from the, the static first approach that they've been pursuing, but get server-side props works and that's where you uh, server-side rendered pages uh, with the uh, serverless functions. Um, any tips on moving from Create React App to Next.js? Honestly, Create React App is great because everything kind of lives in a div. You can move your entire Create React App into an index.js on your Next.js app 
and including including your router, which will lead to some funky bugs, but you can, and then slowly move out all of your different pages into the pages directory. Um, it's a, a really smooth transition process. Depending on your application, you might want to decide if you want to do that. Um, one one thing that uh, I just want to note is again, if you have if you have a large context object or a lot of state that you're sharing across routes, one of the things that I like about regular React is let's just say I'm using React Router. I could wrap a context around like three of my routes and just share state around those routes and that and have it not affect any of the other pages. With next, your context has to wrap the entire application, which can lead to some unusual re-renders and stuff. Pros and cons, pick your poison, but that's that's something to note there. You mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that there are some uh, advantages like SEO. Could you explain a uh, deeper end of it? Yeah, and so that's actually something that, um, look a bit closer at that next pranks application. It, it's, it's a silly application, but it uses some interesting things under the hood. And I'm going to particularly send you to uh, this prankhead.js file. I just dropped it in the chat. Um, with static sites and with server-side rendered sites, your SEO is greatly improved compared to client-side rendered sites because the pages are built ahead of time. Um, it's actually best, SEO is best on static sites, next best on server-side rendered sites, and worst on client-side rendered sites. But uh, again, it's kind of a spectrum of things and, and uh, SEO is improved every single day for, for developers who wanna do all of them. Um, but in this particular file that I sent, um, you'll notice that I programmatically update the title and I change the, the Twitter card and, and uh, the OG images and everything. Um, that kind of stuff you can programmatically change in Next.js really, really easily. This is something that you can't do as easily in uh, a regular React application. And so your SEO is greatly improved by just being able to use that Next Head API um, that lets you programmatically update that. Um, let's see. You're able to use all the other React hooks, right? Right. It's still just React. It just adds some structure to, to React. But yes, you can use all of the other React hooks. And again, you use them in the React part of it, not in the node part of it. You can't use use effect in get static props or get server side props or anything. You do it in the components themselves. Um, what can you tell us about deploying? Uh, what can I tell you about deploying? I don't know what, what questions you have, but actually I'll, I'll pull up my next starter application, for example, um, and, and show you a little bit about how that works. One second, I will share my screen again. Um, and so here's, here's, for example, where, where I deployed this project right here. Um, if you want to see generally how it works, first of all, your domain name appears here whenever you, whenever you deploy, it builds and then publishes and you can see that you can look at the logs for that particular deploy and see what things might have gone right, what things might have gone wrong, what warnings you might have, it, it goes into pretty solid detail on that. Um, and then also there's a, there's a few different things that you can do once you have deployed. Um, you can change uh, your domain name. Um, and so you can change your, your site name here and, and uh, add whatever custom domains that you want. Um, you can roll back to any other previous deploys that you have. You can add any build plugins. Um, we automatically at Netlify install this essential Next.js. You can uninstall it if you want, but you won't want to. Um, all of your serverless functions happen here. Netlify identity is, is something for, for logging in and out if you wanted to drop in uh, logging in and out to your application and authentication. I have a blog post on that. Um, Netlify forms, this is what I mentioned um, that I use in the Next.js adventure uh, application. I added Netlify to the form and it automatically pulls in all of the form data. You can do split testing and that automatically lets you do A-B testing across different branches. That is that is the high level summary about deploying that I think I can tell you. I don't want this to just be an ad for Netlify. It's more about Next.js, but that's, uh, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Um, let's see, not a question. I want to say this is amazing. Thanks, Jose. Um, do you actually recommend to skip an independent server and make all the Next.js from projects that fit in. Adrian, I'm not entirely sure what your question is asking. Would you mind re rephrasing it? Um, let's see, what is the best way of creating a multilingual application with Next? Um, so Next does have a thing called Next Internationalization. 
Um, and so they, they actually have that built into the framework. That being said, I think that there's some better internationalization libraries out there. And so I, I personally use uh, other internationalization libraries rather than the one built in, just because there's some funky base path things that can happen. Um, but yes, you can, you can do that built into the framework. Um, you mentioned that the requests to the API are made during build time. What happens if the API response changes? Um, I kind of answered that before that you can either server side render it every single time. So it'll, it'll run on a serverless function or um, you can rebuild the site and have a webhook or something when the API response changes. I'm confused, is Next.js only for static sites? It can be used for static or server side rendered sites. It's fastest on next sites or on static sites though. And so I tend to recommend that because I like the speed of, of the static ones. Um, what's the difference between React server side render and Next.js? Good question. React server components are very similar. Um, we actually, uh, I, I don't know where the demo is, otherwise I'd, I'd send it to you. We, we made a, an interesting demo with it. Basically, a server component is still experimental, so don't bank on it. Uh, I, I have regular meetings with the React team, and they're all kind of like, yeah, server components are kind of in R&D. We might throw them away, but they're, they're worth trying. So don't go all in on server components yet. Uh, there, there's still a lot of changes to be had there. That being said, um, with server components, they can be run at build time to for static sites or at, on uh, server side rendering things. Next.js provides a framework for React and for doing that sort of thing. And they will probably implement React server components, um, but React server components are it's, it's basically just a separate library from, from Next.js at this point. Um, Next will probably implement them, but it's, it's a separate thing. I hope that answers your question. Um, if you're using TypeScript, will the React function recognize the typing of what gets static props returns? Yes, I am not a TypeScript developer, but yes, it, it, it pays attention to that sort of thing. And, and uh, you can do full typing in, inside of the get static prop stuff. Um, can Next.js handle Pi time? Hope so. Um, coming from a view and Next background, I'm really liking all the stuff the React community is, is coming up with. Yeah, and and honestly, Next for Vue is kind of the same as Next for React. Um, I've I've heard that Next actually has better a, uh, API support and everything, and 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 does a lot of of cooler things. But I haven't used it enough to be able to say if that's true. But they both generally do the same thing, Next and Next, just if you prefer Vue or, or React. Um, let's see. Does using less or SAS require extra config? Less does not. SAS does require node SAS because of the weird pages thing that I told you about, how it's like kind of node, kind of React, and, and it's a combo of both. You will need to install node SAS for SAS, um, but that's it. It's just npm install node SAS, and it'll work. Um, let's see, if you have an API call that changes a lot and create a static page from it, how do you refresh the data from that static page? I would say it depends on what that API is. Um, for myself, I tend to statically generate the page as much as possible, but then if there's specific parts of the page that require that, I actually do a lot of client-side rendering of, of those individual things and, and just have a util for that. I think it's very okay to use all three of client side, server side, and static site generation uh, and, and mix them all together and figure out what is mo most performant for you. Um, I think client side is, is still a perfectly valid way of, of doing things. And, and again, it depends on, on what you want to do because you can just keep regenerating a static site depending on how big your site is. Um, there, there's one and oh, let me see if I can find it. There's, uh, I just totally messed up. I was looking up my coworker, Phil, but I just looked up the name Phil instead of Phil Hawksworth, which is a very silly thing to do. Um, but he made a very cool site called Virtual Lollipop. And I'm going to paste it in the chat here. It's vlolly.net. And um, he generates the site every single time. And it generates really fast, like 15 seconds. Uh, super, super fast. And it generates a new page every single time. And, and it's really interesting. 
it's okay to continually generate your your pages you just want to kind of decide how much you want to do that and and sometimes i like to save the build time and save the server time and just do client side rendering things but it's it's really up to you how you want to do that in some nextjs projects i've always get the use remove unused javascript in google lighthouse is that because of next mm, that's interesting because next automatic code splitting should be able to remove a lot of that um so i'm not sure if that's because of next and i'm sorry that i can't help you with that <laughs> um i think we are out of time but thank you so much for for all of your questions i'm happy to answer more of them i'm also going to be live streaming in a few hours um and so if you have more questions then um i live stream on thursdays at twitch uh tv slash casadu um and so you, i can answer more questions there if you have them but thank you all so much for your time it was really fun chatting with everyone thank you very much cassidy for being once again at wiseland academy for your time and for sharing uh your knowledge with the entire community and for the entire community thank you very much for being here today don't forget to fill out the feedback survey get a chance to win a 30 dollars amazon card uh, it is very important for us and for cassidy as well to help us improve See you in our future events and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Kathy. much. Thank you for having me.